Welcome to Swang and I'm Stan Rubin. Tonight we'd like to give you an introduction into basic search and rescue training. This course was held at Herschel Island Territorial Park and was attended by the Territorial Park Rangers, Ivivik National Park Wardens, and Environmental Protection Canada. We talked with Wayne Mary of Atlan, BC, a consultant and writer of search and rescue survival. Wayne Mary brings a lot of background experience to this training course as he explains. I uh, went to work for the U.S. National Park Service in 1959 and I'd done mountaineering and some rescue long before that and worked as a mountain rescue specialist with the U.S. Park Service uh, for 10 years in Yosemite, Olympic and McKinley National Parks in Alaska where I was chief ranger. And then I worked with the Provincial Emergency Program in British Columbia after I came up to Canada 20 years ago and I um, uh, did quite a bit of work uh, back in the eastern Arctic in the Baffin with uh, emergency measures there and uh, fire and ambulance in various places so uh, it, it goes back a long way. The difference between search and rescue in the north compared to the south is the amount of volunteers and is usually a bit more formal. In the Yukon and the Northwest Territories, uh, search and rescue, uh, land search and rescue is still sort of in its infancy. It's, it's growing. Uh, there's a lot of training needed, and uh, so it's a, it's a nice place to be at this time because uh, there's lots to do. Wayne explains what's involved in search and rescue training. Well, it's an introduction. It, it covers most phases of land search and rescue uh, and it, it includes a lot of uh, the basic skills that are required for search and rescue teams like map and compass work and uh, uh, basic survival stuff and things like that. Um, once people have that information uh, they're pretty well on a level playing field. From there you can start going to other courses like search team leader, uh, search management which is a very very heavy duty course. The manual is about that thick and uh, and then to specialty things like uh, cliff rescue, cliff and embankment rescue, and uh, tracking awareness, uh, which is an awfully interesting course. We begin this section with ropes and knots, as they are important skills in search and rescue okay, training. Right okay, we want to touch just a bit on ropes and knots, because very often in a rescue situation, you're going to have to use <coughs> ropes in some way. You know, very often uh, it might be in a river situation. Uh, might be hauling somebody up a river bank or up, uh, up a steep bluff. It might be protecting a stretcher that's being carried down a slope. Uh, not very often we get into cliff rescues, but uh, of course if you do, then you definitely have to be using some of this stuff. So it's pretty important you know something about this equipment that you're going to be working with and how to use it and just a few basic knots, which are all you really need for a rescue. All, all of us know knots, you know, but we know that some knots are good for something and some aren't. And there's certain knots you don't ever want to use in a rescue situation. <laughs> okay. Let's take a look at the equipment first. Rope, number one. We've got two kinds of ropes here. Out here in Herschel, they issued you uh, four climbing ropes. So these are a climbing rope. This is a rescue rope. What's the difference besides the color? Well, there's a number of differences. Okay. A climbing rope is designed to absorb shock. When people are rock climbing or snow and ice climbing, if the leader falls, he's going to fall for some little distance before the rope comes tight, either around the protection or through the set on the second end. So it's just like an elastic. Yeah, no, it stretches. Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> it stretches. Okay, and the stretch is designed to absorb the shock. Now, obviously, you could tie yourselves together with a steel cable. You know, and when you get the end of the steel cable, you continue on to the bottom in two pieces, right, and cut you right in two. Uh, but this doesn't happen with a climbing rope because it stretches and takes up the shock. Now, unfortunately, if you take a long fall on one of these, it alters the way the rope is put together. It stretches it out and, and, uh, and takes away some of that elasticity. So after a couple of leader falls, they retire <coughs> the rope. And 
50 bucks a crack. You know, they're done. Um, this is usually not the rope you would use for rescue because it is stretchy. Now most of the time when you're rescuing, you're either raising or you're lowering somebody. So you don't want any stretch. This is what's called a dynamic rope because it stretches. Okay, a rescue rope is built different. They, there's various color schemes to these things, uh, but this is one of the common ones. There's usually a gold one and a blue one and an orange one. Uh, you can get all those colors in rescue ropes and take probably some more too. Climbing ropes tend to be all colors of the rainbow. The brighter the better. You know? uh, this is what's called a static rope. It does not stretch. Or it stretches very, very little. So if you rig this thing up through a pulley system and you started raising somebody with it, you'd <clears throat> raise them immediately when you started to pull. Whereas with the climbing rope, you could do it, but you'd be hauling for three minutes just getting the stretch out of it before the object left the ground. So for rescue, you usually want the static ropes, rescue ropes. But in terms of you hanging on the end of one of these, you know, if you're hanging on the end of one of these off the side of the cliff, it looks awfully thin, it really does. But it isn't going to break on you. Your body's going to break first before the rope will. Now, these things got to be treated with tender, loving care. Because <coughs> any one of these ropes that is going to be used for rescue is going to have one or two or three people, or maybe even more, depending on it. And you can't afford to use a rope for anything except that. Once you've used your rope for any other purpose, it should never be used as a rescue rope. And there are some basic rules of using this thing. Number one, you try never to step on it, if you can avoid it, because that grinds grit into it. Uh, number two, you store it out of the sun, because ultraviolet will break down this metal <coughs> material. So keep it in the, stored in some place cool and, and dark, if possible. Uh, number three, you try never to get it close to a campfire. You don't want a spark on it or a cigarette or anything else touching this because it burns or melts quite easily. Uh, just a whole series of things. Uh, just treat it like you'd treat your own jugular vein, you know, because your life may depend on it just about as much. Um, Any time you see a little bit of a ding in the rope, like somewhere in the middle you see a little puff of fiber sticking out, uh, check it over really carefully and be sure that it's only just a very slight bit of surface. Uh, if uh, there's any depression in the rope, anything like that, you immediately cut the rope at that point. Just cut it and you use it for whatever you want to after that, but it's no longer a rescue rope. You might use short lengths for tying up a stretcher or something like that, but you don't want to use it to lift anybody up. Uh, since they're quite expensive, you don't like to have to cut these things, but don't ever put away a rope that's got a, some damage to it. I figure you'll cut it later, because what happens is that all of a sudden there's a need for it, and there's a rescue, and you go dashing out. You grab the first rope you get a hold of, and that's the one that's got the weak spot in it. And uh, all, you, all the strain focuses at that weak spot. So watch that. Wayne Mary demonstrates some of the more commonly used knots in search and rescue training. Knots. All right. Before we start. On, on all the knots, uh, I want to tell you just about a bit about this whole figure eight family of knots. Uh, it's one of the most useful families and it's not mentioned in the, in the book here. Okay, everybody knows an overhand, right? That's an overhand, like that, one time around. That's an overhand, it's a basis of several of your other knots. Okay, in order to make a figure eight, instead of going around once and back through, you go all the way around and then back through, so you come up with a figure eight like that. Okay, so do a figure eight. Okay, just do it like this. Hold up one end. Bring it all the way around the rope like that, so it's on the other side, and then go back through the top. That's figure eight. <laughs> I'll do it for you again. Pull the rope up like that, so the free end's on the right. Go all the way around behind it, and then come back up through the through the hole. Now you got to figure it. Now, this is a basis for a whole lot of other knots. Now you can also make a figure eight on a bite, which gives you a very good end loop. 
what you do is you tie a figure eight, only you tie it with a double rope instead of a single rope. So you make yourself a big free end here like this hanging down. Then you take the end and you proceed to tie a figure eight with it. Okay. And now you've got a figure eight on a bike, or a figure eight end loop. And this is a very good kind of end loop if you have to tie an end loop into a rope for any reason because this knot is a very big knot it doesn't kink your rope sharply anywhere and they're not as big enough so you can work with it to release it and it will be untied fairly easily. Uh, whereas if you tie certain other knots to a jam and you have an awful time untying this one you can untie pretty easily. Okay. okay uh, You can tie two ropes together with a figure eight, what's called a, a figure eight follow through. And it's another knot that you can use to tie two ropes together. You can untie it quite easily. So start out with the end of one rope and tie a figure eight in it. Leave about an eight inch or a foot tail on the end of it. So you got that much. Okay, now with the other end of your rope, and I'll use a different color just to make it a little easier to see here. What we're going to do is follow that knot through. It's a follow through knot. What you do is you start with the other end, pick two ends together, and then just follow this knot right through so that every bend that the one knot makes, you also parallel it with the other knot. You follow it right through like this. So that the two ropes follow each other all the way through the knot. Okay. And when you're done, you have that. Okay. It's a it's a very really strong knot. It won't come untied, and it's good for tying two ropes together and. Uh, it's easy to untie because it's a big enough knot so that uh, you can really work with them. Okay. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't want to work well together. But I, there are not too many situations where you have to tie those two kind of ropes together. Mm -hmm. Okay, when I go to another knot, does everybody know, how many people here know a bowling? Most of you do. Right? Okay. Uh, There's a whole lot of different ways of tying a bullet. <laughs> and uh, we had one method of tying it around your waist, which involves a lot of arm movement. And the good part about this was you could stand on top of a cliff 100 feet above and look at your student down below, and you could tell if he was tying it right just by the way his arms move. You know, but that, that didn't seem to, there's only one way to use that, and that's around your waist, and that's not usually where you're tying. Okay, one way of tying a ball on this, first of all, is to make yourself, with the free end in your right hand, make an overhand knot. And I'm trying to teach this in a different way than that. No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it that way. <laughs> Okay, we'll try this kind of thing around the way. <laughs> okay, bring the rope from the left hand, take the end, bring it around your waist to your right hand. Okay? And leave yourself some room to, uh, to work here. Stretch your arms up straight. Okay, this is for tying yourself into a quick safety bow and just around your waist. You wouldn't use this to climb with, but you went for a quick safety fish if you would. Okay, now, you notice there's an opening here between my arm and the uh, and the rope. Okay, punch your whole fist through that opening. Pop. Okay. Okay. Now, if you look down, there's a triangular opening right right by your waist. Okay, you bring your whole fist up through that opening. You don't let go of the rope. You keep tight hold on the rope, and you bring your whole fist up through that opening. Okay. And suddenly, you find yourself with your 
wrist wrapped up in a loop here. Mm -hmm. you, you let go of it. <laughs> go through the window, that's it. Now, ah, now you're talking. Okay. Okay, now you got this situation. You got the rope like this, and you got this green end here, and you bring it across underneath the rope, and get a hold of it on the other side, and drag it back through that loop that your wrist is in. Bring it back through this loop that your wrist is in. Okay? Now you got a bowling. Okay. 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 Now if it looks like this, it's a bowling. <laughs> right? Look at that bowling. It's uh, very easy to determine if you got a bowling just by looking at it. If you tied it wrong, this little free end will be on the outside instead of on the inside of the loop. Hmm. Or else it'll be a slip knot and it won't do anything. Okay. <laughs> Now, if you want to tighten this up on your waist, keep a hold of the free end of your right hand, get a hold of this outside loop with your left hand, and pull them in opposite directions, and it'll zip right up on your waist. Must have not been right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a short piece. That's pretty hard to deal with. <laughs> Okay, now you're not done. Be sure it's tight because if you happen to tumble upside down and the thing is loose, you know, and you head down, all of a sudden the rope comes off and maybe your pants with it and you wind up at the bottom of the cliff with your pants off. So that won't do it all. Okay, so the next thing you want to do is be sure this thing doesn't come untied because these will sometimes untie themselves within, with uh, alternating pressure. So you want to take the free end and tuck it all the way down under your waist loop next to the knot, bring it up again, and then tuck it through the hole off toward your side. So now you've got an overhand backup, and with a half hitch, or the overhand backup hitch, it's not a half hitch. Okay. Now once you've got that, now you're pretty secure, and if you've got a little rope left over, do it again. Be twice the safe. Okay, remember we were talking about an overhand knot being just that? Okay, that's an overhand knot. Now we're going to the double, we're going to double fishermen's, and a fisherman is made out of overhand. You probably remember a single fisherman's knot. Let me just show you that as a build up to the, to the double fisherman's. Okay, and we'll end one rope, you tie an overhand knot. To make the fisherman's knot, you take the other end of the rope and or the other rope, you pass it through starting at the end here, pass it just right through once, tighten this up and get it out of the way. And then with the other rope, you tie another overhand right around the second rope, like that. And that's a fisherman's knot. That's a fisherman's knot. Single fisherman's knot. Single fisherman's knot. Right? And you tighten them up and you pull them together, and that's a single fisherman's. And actually, this was the standard uh, knot for tying two ropes together for many, many years until uh, somebody discovered the double fisherman's was a little stronger. Okay, this would be all right for miscellaneous use, but you wouldn't want to use it for rescue use. <laughs> now, to do a double fisherman's, you do pretty much the same thing, but instead of, watch this now, instead of just tying a single overhand knot like that, instead of just going around once, you go around twice and you're working back toward your hand. So you go once and then twice and then you go back out through the loop. So you got that. It's like an overhand and an extra loop in. That's right. Okay, I'll do it once more. Instead of just making a single, you go around once and come back through, that's an overhand, right? But for a double overhand, you do it twice. You go around once, you go around twice, and then you go back through the loop. Like that. Is to make, lay it over your hand, make one loop, and then make two loops, just starting right out toward your fingers. And then taking the two separate loops and putting the one behind the other like that. And now you've got a closed hitch. And that's a closed hitch. Okay. And the good thing about this knot is that it will 
the harder you pull it, the tighter it gets. As I say, there's a thousand ways of doing it. I'll, I'll show you this one. In case you don't know the knot, if you already know the knot, we've got a good way of doing it. Use that one. If you don't know it, lay the rope over your hand, make one loop, make two loops, and get a hold of them so that you've got two separate loops here. Separate the two loops, and then just take one and put it behind the other, still facing the same way, but it goes behind the other. You start it out this way, you just put it behind the other one that way. And that gives you your slow pitch. And if you look at the slow pitch, you can always see what it looks like. you got the two ropes side by side with a cross piece across the top there. We'd like to thank each and every one that participated at Herschel Island. Next, an interval in discussion of common words with Dennis Allen, Debbie Gordon Rubin, and Leonard Harry. Hi, my name is Dennis Allen. I'm here today with Debbie Gordon Rubin. Hi. And Leonard Harry. Hi. Leonard is going to give Debbie and myself uh, an introductory lesson. In, uh, and if you looked in, we're going to start with words that we hear every day, but we don't understand, like transitional words like and or but or whatever. So we're going to start off with uglan. I always hear that word uglan, Leonard. What is it? Um, Aglan is uh, but, you, you know, when you want to work outside, you say, Hilami Havo Kalokton Aglan here, Lukuni, as saying that it's raining outside. I was going to work outside, but it's raining. Oh, I see, okay. What about um, the word Amuni? Amuni is uh, when, when somebody says thank you, um, you say, Amuni, it's okay, it's okay, mm, no problem. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, uva and Davra, we hear that all the time. Uva, uva and, and Davra means uh, when you ask somebody uh, what's that thing, they say Davra, you know that thing, what you're looking for. And uh, when um, when you ask somebody, it's just almost the same thing, it's Uva, you know. Like uh, when you want to give somebody a cup, or it's, uh, you say Uva. Oh, okay. Uvanga means me? Yeah. You're talking about um, me, like your, your person? Yeah, you're, you're talking about, Uvanga means me. That's, uh, uh, they use every day, it's me, Uvanga. Mm -hmm. How would you yeah. use Uvanga? Well, uh, I would say uh, if I have a, a coat, uh, whose coat is it, if you ask me, uh -huh. I say Uvanga. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, me. I see, okay. Man. Okay, another word is Huli. Huli. Huli is uh, uh, ongoing, like uh, uh, I had coffee this morning, but I'm still having coffee. Huli had coffee talk to me. Oh, I see, okay. What about um, Ubagut? Ubagut means, Ubagut means uh, more than us. There's more than two. Oh, okay. There's three or more. Say so Ubagut oh, yeah. is us, you know. So it's we plural. We did that, us. Yeah, okay. Ubagut. Okay, here's one I don't know. Uva niptauk. Uva niptauk means uh, uh, here too, here too, you know. Um, uh, Inuvik me, I lived in Inuvik, but I, I had school too. I lived in Uva niptauk, me niptauk, Uva niptauk, Uva you know. Oh, I like, see, okay. Uva Niptau, I still, I had schools also. Uva Niptau. Okay. How about Mani? Mani? Mani. Mani. Mani, yeah. Mani means around here. Mani. You say, uh, if somebody asks you, Umiwa, 
Peter Rockford, where are they playing? Manny. You say Manny. You know, Around Ronnie. here. Oh, Manny. I see. Okay. Okay. Ilani? I L A N I. Is Ilani? that how you pronounce it? Ilani, yeah. Ilani? Ilani? Ilani. Yeah. Ilani. Sometimes, you know. Um, Ilani means uh, it's uh, like uh, that camera is. Uh, Work sometimes, but uh, sometimes it breaks down. Okay. Tarik toilet, makot, yane, navigure. They break down sometimes. The oh, camera? See. Oh, okay. Okay. Unaptauk. Unaptauk is uh, still, it's uh, this one too, you know. Uh, if, I, if you go to school mm -hmm. uh, here, mm -hmm. and this one to not talk to be. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I could like I'll be on teaching you. Yeah. Unap talk to be. Yeah. Unap talk to be. Okay. Okay. Oh, right on. Mm -hmm. What about uh, Paglan? Paglan. 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 Yeah. Paglan. Yeah. Paglan is uh, Paglan. This uh, you greet somebody, Pagalan, you something to, like a truck, you have a truck out there? Yeah. You're going to meet somebody in the airport, Pagalan means. Oh, to meet you someone? Can, yeah. Oh, I see, okay. That. Okay. Is that word? Um, Pagalan is, uh, it's don't use too much, you know uh -huh. that. Yeah. Pagalan. Maybe in Alaska, they still use it a lot, though, eh? Yeah, that, yeah. That uh -huh. uh -huh. the well, the uh, taxi, Pagalan. Uh -huh. To meet somebody, to greet somebody. Uh -huh. Yeah, Pagalan. Maybe you, I'm pronouncing it different because I hear it like yeah. Pagalan, maybe? Pagalan? Pagalan, is, that, a, is Pagalan. that the same thing or no? No? Okay, uh, well. There's no word. Okay, I must Pagalan. be hearing the wrong one. What about Davrani? Davrani means right there. You know, like uh, they play northern games. Tavrani, Tim Kui Patni, Tavrani. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, um, it's just like um, Mani is right here and Tavrani yeah. is Dabrani over there? Yeah, over there. Okay. Just almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, okay. would, how would you say it in that? Uh, use it in any dialect then, Tavrani. Tavrani? Yeah. Like, like in a sentence. Oh. Uh, in it, Pira, I mean, Tavrani, Pira, or like the. The one uh, have northern games, they always uh, play at uh, Jim Kui Park. Oh, okay, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Run. Showing the place? Yeah, in the place, the uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, um, we've got to wrap it up for this session, but uh, we'll be coming back throughout the year with Leonard and uh, or other guests, whoever we can get in to uh, help us out. So uh, thanks for joining us today. In the sofa. Yeah, the one I first I cut it really soft. Even that I cut it up. Well, early this morning we got them up. Mm. Yes, yes. Mm. That's nice. No wonder. Mm. They should put it in cold water. Oh. Leave them in the cold water. Uh huh. At the same time that uh, here we never try that.